Hi everyone, my name is Alex and welcome to the second devlog for Point Cloud. It's been a little while, so a lot has changed. I moved to a new apartment, as you can see. I went to Europe for the first time, sort of, and slowly but surely have been trying to transform my little arcade game prototype into more of a vertical slice demo kind of thing. I actually took it to a Boston game dev demo night a few days back and had multiple people try it, with the main feedback being that it felt really polished, if a little basic, I added that last part, um, which I was really happy about, especially since a huge amount of my dev time since the last video has been spent on esoteric Unity optimization, just trying to make it a smooth experience. So I'll take it. And I guess with that, let's just jump right into a rundown of what's been happening with Point Cloud. After my last video, I decided to take the advice of the great minds over at Valve Software and sent a build off to one of my friends for a little bit of playtesting. Now, admittedly, this friend has a very bad laptop, so I wanted to use it as a kind of worst case scenario to see if Point Cloud's performance could live up to its minimalist graphics. And, um, I'm sure you can tell by how I'm talking that it didn't exactly go well. Tragically, I don't have any footage of this playtest, but it looked a little something like this. Of course, I've heard the advice ad nauseum that you should avoid premature optimization and that performance should come last, all else being equal. And while I understand where people who say this are coming from, this was too much. I don't want to show people a laggy game, I don't want to play a laggy game, and I'm certainly not as motivated to continue working on the project if I'm constantly thinking about the potentially abysmal performance in the back of my mind. So, I decided it was time to fix it. And oh boy, it took a while. At first I assumed, somewhat correctly, that the problem was being caused by excess garbage collection. This is something Unity is fairly uh, well known for, and is genuinely something you have to watch out for while developing in the engine. So, I set out to implement object pooling for pretty much every object in the game. Enemies, particle effects, bullets, XP drops, anything that would need to be constantly spawning and despawning. And real quick, just in case you don't know, object pooling is basically keeping a giant list of pre-instantiated objects rather than instantiating a new one every time you need it. Object pooling helped a ton with boosting overall performance, but upon a quick glance over the Unity profiler, I started to notice a lot of little things built into Unity and c -sharp themselves that were eating up a bit of memory each frame. And the further I looked into this, the more my understanding of the correct way to do things in Unity started to break down. I don't really know what to do with all this information, so... Here is a list of the four most important things I learned that I haven't really seen anyone talk about before. Number one, C Sharp String Builder sucks. You've probably seen debug messages and other string related operations in Unity projects written like this. This is called a template string, and it's a really common feature in modern programming languages that allows you to inject values directly into a string without having to write it out manually using concatenation, or whatever the hell is going on with printf in C. Here's an equivalent line in JavaScript. Unfortunately, because C Sharp, much like Java, is obsessed with being 100% object-oriented all the time, this feature is implemented using the string builder class, and that class generates garbage for each new string you build, which is not good. Looking for solutions, most people seem to agree that just sticking to old school concatenation is unfortunately the best bet. Number two, don't use coroutines. Coroutines are Unity's native system for running asynchronous code. 
As far as I can tell, they're effectively deprecated in favor of the job system, but people still use them all the time because they're super convenient and easy to understand, unlike jobs. However, much like String Builder, they generate garbage. Specifically, the yield statements like wait for seconds, wait until, etc. that can suspend execution for a certain amount of time. They're implemented using classes and have to be instantiated with the new keyword each time they're needed. You could cache the objects they generate, but at that point you're already starting to lose the main advantage of coroutines, which is their convenience. Luckily, there's an open source library called Unitask, which is designed to replace both vanilla c -sharp tasks and Unity coroutines at the same time. It's a little hard to wrap your head around at first, especially when it comes to managing cancellation tokens, but it's implemented using structs, meaning no garbage, and uses proper, modern, async, await syntax that any web developers will be immediately familiar with. Using the unitask void variant, it's essentially a drop-in replacement for coroutines, and I highly suggest you check it out. Number three, don't use on GUI. Unity has a built-in wrapper library for Dear I Am GUI, which allows you to draw simple UI elements directly to the screen without needing extra game objects, scripts, UI components, or anything. It's actually really useful for drawing debug info, which is why it pains me to tell you that this also generates garbage. I don't even fully know why, but that's what the profiler tells me, and I've since mostly avoided it. You probably should too, unless I'm missing something obvious, which is definitely possible. Finally, number four, use an update manager. This one was probably the most surprising and something I never would have figured out on my own because it has to be measured manually. Basically, Unity's built-in mono behavior functions are executed each frame from the engine's C++ backend. As in like, each frame, the compiler tells the computer, okay, go find this function in the c -sharp code and then run it. For each object, rather than having the whole thing execute on the c -sharp side. And this has a performance cost, one that adds up the more objects you have in your scene. And because it's the literal execution of the function that's costing performance, that means even an empty update call is eating up your precious microseconds. Luckily, there's an extremely simple solution in the form of an update manager. A tiny class that receives its one native Unity update call, and then just calls a custom update method on all of your objects from c -sharp. There's a million pre-made solutions as well. I'm using this one from Gilzoid, which is free, open source, and <laughs> god damn it, it works. So, having gained all this new knowledge, the base performance of Point Cloud was looking great. I was getting over 1200 FPS in a release build, and even my friend's god-awful laptop was hitting over 200. In between thermal throttles down to 40. And maybe we should wait until that computer cools down a bit, I guess. <laughs> However, something about the experience still felt off and I started to suspect that something other than performance may be the culprit. See if you can spot the issue. The game had this tiny jitter that wouldn't go away, and became exponentially worse the lower the frame rate was. It almost looked like rubber banding in a multiplayer game, which made no sense considering Point Cloud has zero networking code whatsoever. Something was clearly wrong, and at this point, I was completely stumped. The only thing that seemed to have any effect at all was to disable the physics interpolation? Only issue is doing that locks all the motion in your game to 60 FPS, which looks visibly choppy at higher frame rates. But this turned out to be a good lead. I've actually suspected for a while now that there's something off about the physics interpolation in Unity. It often overreacts to tiny hitches in performance, leading to this rubber banding behavior. And unfortunately for me, someone who pretty much solely works in 2D at the moment, this effect is way more noticeable in 2D. Eventually, I did find a solution, which involved carefully reading a nine year long forum thread 
discussing how the way Unity measures frame time either is or was fundamentally flawed, something which is known by Unity and has been quietly addressed multiple times through various patches, although there still might be something wrong with VSync, and also the way that game engines in general measure frame time is fundamentally flawed because it doesn't take into account how long the frame actually lasted on your screen, partially because most graphics APIs don't even report this number, but there's like one offshoot of Vulkan that only runs on Linux, I think, that does report it? Anyway, the long and short of it is, I think there might genuinely be something wrong with the way Unity handles physics interpolation. I could be wrong, but that's how it seems to me after trying literally everything else I could think of. So how did I finally fix this issue? Yeah, I don't really know why I never tried that before. I guess I just assumed that running physics every frame would instantly tank your performance, but somehow that's not the case. My frame rate hasn't meaningfully changed at all, and the game is now perfectly smooth and stable, even at very low frame rates. So yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of all that, other than the fact that I kind of, sort of, maybe, see where the Unity haters are coming from now. So, with all that out of the way, it was time to actually add things to the game. Before we get to keeping my promise from the last video and talking about the main problem I've been working on, the spawn system, let's quickly go over the many smaller things I've added since last time. It's 2025 and lives are boring. You die, you respawn, and nothing was really lost other than a few seconds of your time. It's basically just an annoyance, and even Mario realized this almost... 10... years ago. Instead, I tried something else. When you get hit, you lose your shield, which then slowly recharges over time. If you get hit again while your shield is down, you die. I really like how simple this is. On one hand, it's like you have infinite lives. If you play well and don't get hit often, there's nothing stopping you from hitting insane scores. On the other hand, it's like you only have two lives. Pretty cutthroat. I like the contrast it provides between low and high stakes depending on whether your shield is up. It took me a while to really dial this feature in, but I'm pretty happy with how it's ended up. I added hit stop to give you a split second to figure out what just happened. I added this red glow to the screen that helps you keep track of how much danger you're in. And finally, just before the demo night, I also added some camera shake to try to give it an extra layer of juice. Personally. I think it looks and feels pretty good. Next there are two new types of enemies. The first one is called the Martyr and alternates between rotating to face the player and moving in a straight line. On death it spawns three gnats, these little square guys, that move quickly around in a circle. Then there's the Portal which stays in one spot and continuously spawns the Swarm a group of tiny, fast enemies that are pretty tough to avoid. I added this 3D background using a second perspective camera. I added these lines to indicate where an enemy is spawning, meant to look like the enemies are like dropping out of hyperspace or something. And lastly, I added these warning symbols to give the player a heads up and avoid them dying to an enemy spawn they had no idea was coming. I also started working on this weird little sequencer thing that I plan to use for pretty much all visual effects in the game, like the spawn warning. And I'm thinking of turning it into its own standalone open source plugin thing. So let me know if you'd be interested in a tool like that or if you just want to hear more about it. Okay, at long last, let's finally talk about the core of Point Cloud, the enemy spawning system. What I've ended up with for now is maybe a bit of a monstrosity code-wise, um, but it seemingly works pretty well with all the tweaks and changes I've made, so I haven't found a reason to completely start from scratch yet. 
At the beginning of each wave, I'm still using that shop system I mentioned last video for picking which enemies get included. These three core variables, controlling the number of ticks per wave, the max allowed number of enemies alive, and the frequency with which enemies are spawned, are all updated according to these three curves I pretty much just eyeballed in Desmos. The spawning frequency is then randomized within a small range. For the actual spawning itself, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the problem I was up against is actually the exact same problem that loot tables are designed to solve. You're likely familiar with them if you've ever played procedurally generated games like Minecraft, which uses them for many things including mob drops, treasure chests, piglin trades, and even the item you get when you break a block. Loot tables take a predetermined set of arbitrary values and an associated weight, where a higher weight usually means a more frequent occurrence, and returns a random item according to their weight distribution. Now, I had no idea how to do this in an optimized manner, but luckily this appears to be a solved problem. I made this weighted list class that implements the Vos alias method as described in this blog post here by Keith Schwartz. I highly recommend giving it a look if you're interested, and I might end up making a video going into more detail on the algorithm in the future. Let me know if you're interested in that. Using the weighted list, I can control which enemies appear in the level, um, where they spawn, how they spawn, how many spawn at a time, alongside the frequency for each of those respectively. It's a little esoteric to work with at the moment, and I'll probably end up reworking the system a ton, especially once I have more levels and more than four types of enemies. For now, I'm just balancing completely based off vibes, which seems not ideal uh, in the long run. So if you have any ideas on how to tackle that, I'd love to hear them. For now, let's move on to the future. What's next for Point Cloud? For now, I'm moving full steam ahead on finishing the vertical slice, having a fully playable, polished demo of a single level as kind of a proof of concept as to what a complete package version of Point Cloud could look like. That means more enemies, more power-ups, sound effects, music, uh, quality of life features, etc. And I'm really excited to keep working on it. I have a lot of ideas I want to implement and hopefully it doesn't take six months this time. But before we pack this up, I have good news. The latest version of the Point Cloud demo is available to play right now on itch.io. The link is down in the description, so give it a try, roast me in the comments, or you could be normal and just leave feedback. It's up to you. Um, it's a little bare bones, but I'm pretty happy with the state it's in for moving forward with development. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you want to support the project, please consider subscribing and sharing this video with anyone you think might vibe with Point Cloud. And if you want to go above and beyond, you can support my work over at patreon.com slash poke underscore bd. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day.